Hey folks, um, I'm just uh, taking a little bit of time. I meant to actually, I intended to write a blog post for this, but I kind of am a bit scattered. And so I think I'm going to just do a live here and um, do a little tentacular thinking and documentation. And then I can throw some images um, online so people can see uh, what I'm talking about. Um, I'm here on Lemon Hill in Philadelphia and it's a beautiful sunny Sunday and it's very heartening because there are people out, um, people flying kites, people having cookout birthday parties, people with their dogs, um, and it's quite wonderful. And I was sort of shopping around for a place to sit and do this, and um, you know, it's actually kind of noisy <laughs> that we're near a highway, and and Philadelphians, like certain segments of Philadelphia, really love their motorbikes. <laughs> and evidently, this must be a really good ATV motor bike day. So there's like the zooming around of the motorbikes and then in the distance there's like a drum corps so if the sound isn't super great um that's why but clearly people are mostly enjoying themselves so that's wonderful and when i was shopping around so uh, yesterday as you guys know like i i work at a garden and um i was at an event where we were sort of asking people to leave little love notes um to the to the garden and to nature and this little girl came up and you know she was talking about what she loved about the garden and um her her mom reminded her of the tree friends and she's like yeah i love the tree friends and so today i was sort of looking around for the tree friends and so today i don't know if you can sort of see it in the background but um the tree that i picked is sort of a modest cedar tree and i thought that that was particularly um apt since i guess the symbolism of the the cedar is strength and it is also healing and um generosity i think um and i know in the pacific northwest um, the indigenous people, really a lot of their cultural ways are linked to um, the cedar tree. So I thought like the cedar would be a nice, a nice accompaniment um, for me today. And pardon my, my hair all spinning all around. But um, so I have been spending some time working my way through this book uh, called Hugh Everett III and the, the Many Worlds. And he was a, a physicist and his idea was that um, connected with sort of this quantum entanglement that there were different parallel realities happening and I find that very interesting because as well as a, a spiritual engagement I feel like maybe we're also in something having to do with quantum physics um, which is certainly not my area of expertise but I this there's a lot of interesting stuff in here and he uh, he got his his degree in physics at Princeton uh, during the Cold War era and a lot of what he was really good at was um, game theory and sort of decision management planning with very elaborate um, algorithms and projections and math things and um, a lot of it had to do with um, you know global global thermonuclear warfare or whatever and like you know doing these risk profiles and threat analyses and you know I think a lot of this is connected not just with uh, um, nuclear weapons, but also with other theories of risk analysis and um, weapon systems. Um, and it seems like increasingly the weapon systems we may be up against are, um, you know, this bio nanotech and um, neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience related, you know, mind engineering and propaganda. And so like the tools of war kind of are starting to feel different to me now, especially a year into all of this. So um, I'm reading through and they're talking about um, this threat and um you know a friend of mine raul he had um given me a link to an earlier piece he had written um last year about um i can't remember the gentleman's name but he was with darpa in wuhan and bioterrorism and at some point in that article they were talking about um the nuclear threat initiative and i believe it was sam nunn was with this nuclear threat initiative and that uh, ted turner um, was also the founder of this nuclear threat initiative and one of the individuals who was connected with that i believe it was actually don't quote me on that maybe check avril haynes who was at event 201 that, that was connected with this nti initiative and again i believe that the the nuclear threat initiative isn't strictly limited to nuclear weapons but as larger systems of risk analysis simulations projection analysis because avril haynes her specialty was applied physics social physics specifically with johns hopkins applied physics lab and then now like in the in the interim since event 201 she's become the head of national intelligence so that really sort of of pricked up my ears when I was thinking hmm like game theory um, Cold War nuclear weapons what are sort of the future of warfare um, 
you know, Michael Crow at Arizona State University, they have this Center for the Future of War that's funded by Eric Schmidt largely um, and New America. And, you know, one of their three focus areas, I think there's maybe four now, includes weaponized narrative. So it's very interested in this narrative aspect. And, you know, Ted Turner was someone who I had just a tiny little bit like, I mean, everybody talks about like the key figures. You know, you've got the Gates, you've got Bloomberg, you've got Omidyar, you know, you have sort of these various tiers. And Ted Turner wasn't any like anybody I'd really ever thought much about. But after it's sort of this, you know, I do this tentacular thinking, thinking about it, I was like, hmm, let me go back and revisit. So um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the Good Club. Um, but in 2009, a very select group of billionaires uh, were asked, invited to a special like invitation only event at the home of the president of Rockefeller University on the Upper East Side in New York. And it was framed as sort of, you know, solving environmental and world crises, health crises, and also overpopulation, right? Like there we, we come at it again as the eugenics and this Malthusian mindset. And so the word sort of got out on that, but Ted Turner was at this event, the Good Club. And again, it's 2009 is two years after Global Impact Investment Network set up um, this, you know, set up the infrastructure, the began, began to set up the infrastructure for the apparatus of social impact investing and linking it ultimately to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And what do you know, like Ted Turner actually with a billion dollar commitment helped create the United Nations Foundation to like integrate um, the, the programs of the United Nations with the United States. Billionaire turned philanthropist Ted Turner agrees and he's pledged the majority of his money to the UN Foundation to help eradicate poverty and disease and to the Nuclear Threat Initiative to eliminate nuclear weapons. When you gave the money to the United Nations you said I want to put all you rich people on notice. I'm coming after you to give more money. Well, I, that was, I said that, but and just by saying that, uh, it, 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 it caused a lot of people, I'm sure, to, to think about it. Did you know Bill Gates and Warren Buffett before I, that? I did. I, I didn't know them real well, but I, I knew them. Environmental work was always focused on private land ownership. And as we know, sort of the whole event to, uh, sorry, Agenda 21 initiative is sort of pushing most people into compact sort of mega city regions and then leaving the wilderness, quote unquote, like to the billionaire class, and then they will preserve it, I guess, ostensibly. And so like Ted Turner is actually one of the largest private landholders. You know, I think he's still alive. I know that he was he was el like not doing well and had dementia or whatever, but like he, he his assets, Turner Enterprises, like own some of the largest stocks of private land, including a lot of land in New Mexico and I believe Wyoming. So they're doing environmentalism, but it's environmentalism on private property, not for the public good and not for the, the benefit of the beings themselves per se. Um, and he's involved, you know, again, with this sort of eugenics based element. And so I found a clip today when I was digging into this a little bit more and it was around, I believe it was 2010. And um, on a news program, he's talking about, you know, his philanthropy. In addition to the good club, he was also a donor to this um, giving pledge. And so that was started by Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. And, and it's these billionaires who are saying they're going to divest themselves of significant amounts of assets and just give it to philanthropy, which as we know is really market shaping for this crazy technocracy world that's coming. So he's talking in this clip and it's just a four minute clip and it's it's on my, my Twitter uh, and my Facebook thread. But you know, it's only four minutes, but like halfway in, you know, she's like, gosh, it must be really hard to save the world. And he's like, yeah, but I, you know, I do my best. And I was just in New York lately and I, I spent some good time picking up trash. In the world is a hard job. What would you say to people who don't have so much money? Should oh, they I be doing that too? Or don't have any money. Well, one thing they can do is pick up trash. That's what I do. I, I, we're in New York now. And yesterday I walk around the block and I pick up trash. I don't believe you. Up, I swear to God. Absolutely. I Why? pick up trash in Atlanta because I want to set a good example. President Kagame of Rwanda has passed a rule that on the third Saturday of each month, uh, the entire country has to go out from 8 to 11 and pick up trash, including him and the cabinet of Rwanda. They all go out and pick up trash, and Rwanda is just as clean a country as Switzerland. How does one innovate again in the United States? Well, there's a lot of innovating being done right, right now. I just came up uh, this week from a, a conference on uh, mobile health. Uh, and what's being done with cell phones in the developing world to transport uh, uh, medical information to people 
and to gather it. And it's just absolutely amazing the things that are being invented. And it was such an odd non sequitur, like in the middle of this thing that he's talking about picking up trash. And then it, it triggered in my mind um, a couple of years ago when I was lo first looking at digital identity systems and impact tokens, impact verification, IXO Foundation was a key figure, um, a key entity in lifting up it's based in, in Switzerland, uh, these token economics, like verification uh, that you have accomplished some sustainable goal with an impact token. In this case, their trials were on Internet of Things cook stoves and pre-K attendance. So they were putting children on blockchain so they could track pre-K attendance with tokens for the impact investors. So one of their... Um, staff people, I believe her name was Ann Connolly, you know, she was talking about, well, how do we get the data? Like, how do we, because it's all about trust. That's blockchain. It's trust. Like, how are we going to get this data? And so they were talking last mile verifications. And all of this has to be done at scale. And it has to be done, like, in real time data analytics. And so that's what they're still working the kinks out on. I mean, they've been working on this for, you know, the last five to 10 years of figuring out how to scale this blockchain impact verification. But one of the things she mentioned um, was, well, they are just do a broker. IXO, it just sort of sets up the infrastructure, but it's up to the various parties to decide how they will document impact. And they said, well, for example, if you clean up a beach, um, you know, some people might just accept a photograph that you cleaned up the beach, right? Like a before and after photograph, and that's the blockchain impact verification is whatever that image is. Whereas other people might want to have an internet of things enabled scale, right? And that that impact token depends on the weight of the stuff that you've, um, sorry, there's a, there's a dog running around, the scale of what you've collected, the scale of the trash. And so there's different levels of requirements, but all of it is internet of things enabled, whether it's a photo or data uploaded on a scale. And so I'm thinking, wow, okay, so Ted Turner in 2010 is like regaling people with how important it is that poor people pick up trash. And then a few years later, they're segueing into blockchain identity systems and good social behaviors, proactive social behaviors that will be linked to the, you know, cleaning the environment because, you know, Ted Turner is all about environmental protection. And so we should get those poor people to go pick up the trash. And then, woo, you know, then you can log it with your impact verification. And so this, all of this is my like tentacular thinking. I, you know, I've been looking back at like the poetry of William Carlos Williams and this idea of like being inspired by everyday objects. And so we have in our house, we have two recycling bins, these blue square like buckets. And one is sort of the inside recycling bin for like clean, like trash paper. And then the other one is our outside recycling bin where the cans and, you know, other recycled packaging goes in the outside and it's like really messy and it always like breaks up. But on that outside uh, recycling bin is a barcode and it's for something called the Philly Recycle Bank. This is my recycling bucket. So this is this is what the, the sticker looks like, the reward sticker. Recycle right, get rewarded, only not anymore because that's over and you can see I have some nice little tulips here, but uh, the overall recycling. And um, so I wrote a little poem, like a tribute to William, Car like apologies maybe to William Carlos Williams' wheelbarrow poem. And, I, I, and nobody really got it on Twitter today, but I'm just gonna read it into the record so you guys have it too. Um, uh, the singularity depends upon the blue recycle bin glazed with rainwater barcoded by the back door. And so that probably seems really odd that I would say something about the barcode on the recycle bin on my back door, but there are stories in these objects and stories that can be told in important stories. And in this case, you know, I'm living in the belly of this beast. I guess we all are maybe. And once we sort of awaken to what we're in, we see these, these connections. But Recycle Bank was a project that started essentially in 2004 and our city adopted it in 2009. And at the time, the um, our mayor was pr promoting it and his name was Michael Nutter and he was very tight with Michael Bloomberg, who, as we know, is sort of a leader in the climate, the World Health Organization, sort of the, the you know, I will say it, the nanny state uh, techno enterprise, uh, much of it linked to the Sustainable Development Goals, which in retrospect, we realize clearly Michael Bloomberg does not have the long-term health in interests of the people. He's actually creating data markets because his, his fortune is built on data analytics and predictive analytics. So Michael Nutter, who was our mayor, signed us up for this recycle bank program. And it seems very innocuous, right? Um, here, just put a barcoded sticker on your recycle bin and you can earn points for recycling every week. And isn't that great? And, and essentially it's script. 
And so when I talk about blockchain, it's script. It's company store script. And, and it's the, very much akin to um, the stuff that we see in kids' classrooms now with classroom management apps and PBIS tokens. If you behave, if you demonstrate the proper behavior, you will get some script that you can use for a thing, but not just anything. You can use it for the things that we say. So Recycle Bank, it wasn't giving you cash, but it would give you vouchers and discounts with partners, right? And all of that sounds super innocuous, right? But the interesting thing is it's incredibly behaviorist. And once we understand what these impact markets are going to be doing with um, the, the social impact and the tracking and the de describing what is good behavior and what your expectations are of demonstrating good behavior. It reminds me a lot of there's there's um, an educational theorist. His name is Alfie Cohn. And unfortunately, Alfie Cohn doesn't seem to really have figured out what's going on with impact investing. But he was very good about talking about the fact that behaviorism isn't good for kids and it's not really good for people. Uh, because once you start rewarding people for something they would have done anyway, it actually undermines their motivation to do it. So if you have a kid, like it's internal motivation versus extrinsic motivation, right? And so if you have someone who's like a curious learner or who's really engaged and just does it for their own personal satisfaction, that's very motivating and they will keep at it. But if you take that same learner and then you say, well, we're gonna reward your learning behaviors with tokens, then they actually become demotivated, right? And so there's this very twisted element. Most people, um, recycle not because they expect to get points but because it's part of what they feel is a right way to deal with things and but in many respects recycling is tied to these larger global supply chains right like why do we have to recycle um, a lot of it is because we have consumer habits that are predicated on mass consumption of global commodities right these are commodities that are coming all over the world that have an huge amounts of plastic you know and other materials that are based in these supply chains and so like we're doing our part we think by recycling but it's kind of like that paper straw like we can fix the environment if everybody switches to a paper straw it doesn't actually change the larger dynamic of these global supply chains and the use of plastic in those supply chains and the fact that the plastics in and of themselves <clears throat> a lot of them have endocrine disruptors that lead to long-term chronic illness like diabetes, which is an impact market, by the way, um, and cancer, which can be leveraged to have genomic cancer research that you can then pivot into using that DNA, you know, programming to turn you into a transhumanist cyborg, <laughs> right? And so there are these um, very weird intersections with the recycling that, that, that we should be having bigger questions that it's not just about um, making sure you recycle and then having it barcoded and the barcode is attached to your name and your address so they know where you are so that you can get rewards points that you can then trade in with their preferred vendors for various items. Um, but it's, it's, it's why do we use so much plastic in the first place? Like, why are we doing this at all? And the thing that's really interesting is that in Philadelphia, um, and of course the Recycle Bank, one of the, the founders was a Wharton grad. So there's the Wharton connection again, the impact investing. Um, uh, you know, eventually the bottom fell out on the recycling market because guess what? Like most of our plastic, most of our recycling went to China and then China didn't really feel like using our recycled any, you know, stuff anymore and they weren't really gonna buy it. And then at that point, the whole recycling thing, well, they're like, well, we're not gonna reward you anymore because we're not making any money on it. And in fact, um, we're gonna actually burn half of our recycling in Chester, which is a, a smaller town um, down the river from Philadelphia. And it's a, it's a very poor community and it's a predominantly black community. And it has this giant incinerator. So they're like, hey, it's great. It's gonna be super green. We'll just burn our recycling for energy. And then that should be good enough, right? And that's because it's about global markets. It's not really about the environment. Um, so, you know, I just, you know, I wanted to talk about these various things because they're all embedded in our life. And, um, you know, I guess this covers most of it. But, oh, the other bit that I wanted to talk about, Ted Turner. So he's based in... Um, Atlanta, right? And and so his big, his fortune was built on like the 24-7 media consumption. And, you know, what else is in Atlanta is, um, well, Georgia Tech is in Atlanta. So, you know, Georgia Tech is a major, major defense contractor. They have a ton of um, various high-end like programs with broadband. Uh, the gentleman who's advancing the internet of bio nano things is based there. Um, if you look at their tech transfer page for Georgia Tech, 
um, there's a lot of scary stuff going on with sort of advancing us towards this cybernetic future. And there's a lot of money in it too, um, clearly just from seeing the, the technology patents that you can license. And then the other piece is the media. So there's something called the e-narrative prototyping program uh, out of Georgia Tech. And there's also gaming. There's a gaming program there in terms of gamification. Um, and Georgia Tech is also advancing this global blockchain-based um, certifications, which Angel Cabrera is the new president, relatively new president there. He came out of George Mason before that. And so he's in, in the Thunderbird School of Management before that. And that is Michael Crow at Arizona State and in QTEL. And so clearly, again, the future of war is weaponized narrative. This weaponized narrative is being sort of prototyped through Georgia Tech. And part of it is about like they're a member of something called the Interactive Television Alliance. And this Interactive Television Alliance is almost like using these smart TV technologies to mine your emotions and manipulate you as you're consuming media. So, you know, th this idea of Ted Turner and 24-7 media and, um, you know, eventually it, it melded into Time Warner and the weaponization of media. And then, of course, the other thing that's in Atlanta, you know, is the CDC, right? And so if you understand the larger, like, again, my background is in cultural landscape. And so what is happening in these different geographies? What is happening in these different areas? And I hadn't spent a lot of time really looking into Atlanta, but I think more people should. And, um, you know, more people should really question this green agenda because if it's linked to, if it's not interrogating global supply chains, if it's not interrogating um, defense and militarism, if it's not interrogating the cyborg future that they seem to want to solve the problems of um, the, you know, the problems they've created, like that the imperative of exponential growth that's required under a capitalist paradigm that is going to need to turn us into um, cybernetic beings. And, you know, I was just looking back today at the Moonshot paper, this Japan Science and Technology Agency, and, you know, they were talking about brain machine interfaces and um, that by 2050, you know, that they're going to train people up to use their consciousness, to use their, um, their brain intent to have these brain machine interfaces that we will live um, through avatars with with this focused intention and is that where we should be focusing our intention I, I don't I don't think so and, and what's going to happen to these children because you know I've seen a lot lately that there's a focus on the social emotional curriculum and on mindfulness and on executive function a lot of this research is all coming in together a lot of it is through Harvard a lot of it is being backed by Zuckerberg and Gates and they want children to be able to manage their minds and to to manage their minds in terms of living in a future that's almost unconceivable right now that we really don't even have the language to talk about what it is that they're building and then once they have those skill sets that they can leverage that to somehow manage like remote robots or something um so anyway i i think that's all i had to say about ted turner and picking up trash and impact tokens um there is a whole big white paper that I just found about the sustainable development goals and impact tokens and programmable money. Oh, I forgot one more thing. Okay, so the, the, the other thing is on the impact token, so how this all works, is it's layers, right? It's vertical. So they create the harm, they create the global supply chains with the plastics that harm the environment, harm the water cycle with the microplastics, endocrine disruptors, chronic illness. Now those are diseases that are now turned into impact sectors. Um, and then you, you make people pick it up, make people pick up the plastic. You have the wearable technology that will document the impact. So on the, and, and this is, you know, this is just my crazy imagination, but I'm assuming they'll probably connect in with piezoelectric energy harvest, right? And so they'll make the people walking up and down the beach, picking up the plastic bottles, um, power their own wearable devices, or maybe, you know, extract the extra current up to some other battery as an impact market. And the other piece of the, the things in Philadelphia is we had this thing called um, ready, willing, and able. Okay, so this is another one of these NGOs that is ostensibly set up to help transition people who have been uh, experiencing homelessness or people who are, um, uh, you know, coming out of incarceration or other things into work. And they actually have a program that's called Work Works. How original, right? And so, you know, and I remember back in the day, and this is like all retro, like looking backwards about what these things were at the time. And like, none of us knew this at the time, or, you know, it's hard to conceive, but 
um, you know, it was like a very young sort of chipper young woman and her mother was a well-connected philanthropist who was on the state appointed school board. And, you know, she was with a group that was like sort of all of the young professional tech people, you know, who are going to fix the world with technology. And again, this is like eight to 10 years ago and, you know, it all looks good. And, but guess who, where these people had to work? Well, they would go downtown and they would clean up, um, they would pick up trash in the in the business district. And this was part of one of these business improvement districts, right? The public-private partnership. So they would go down and gentrifying parts of the city and the business parts of the city, and they would clean up the trash. So everyone had a very nice environment to be in. Meanwhile, large swaths of the rest of the city were subjected to short dumping and all sorts of trash. And like, you know, here in the in the city, um, the stormwater, we have very old sewers. And so when there's stormwater overflow, all of the gutters, like the plastic bottles wash in the gutters and they all wash into the rivers and the creeks and so none of this got, got taken care of but the the posh parts of town the the people who are homeless or the people who are you know getting you know the returning citizens they were all put on work to work programs right and trained up for some skills but i can just see how these social impact markets are going to like leverage the environmental component of trash picking up with workforce readiness of the poverty management but again once you make these things into impact markets you don't solve the problem. You have every disincentive from solving the problem. Um, you know, it's important in historic context just to consider that often um, uh, organized crime has been part of the waste removal uh, environment. So it'll be interesting to sort of imagine how that figures into sort of blockchain uh, waste management uh, with sort of that history attached to it. And then the other thing I did want to sort of point out at the end regarding uh, pathways, sort of uh, workforce development pathways or returning citizen pathways uh, and having people pick up trash and clean up, do public cleanups uh, programs is that uh, the largest for-profit prison uh, companies in the United States like CoreCivic and Geo Group are both interested in pivoting out of not exclusively out of, like not that that's going away, but actually pivoting into the social workspace and this idea that you will be uh, doing continuum of care pathways. And so that includes like both, uh, you know, online learning, workforce-based learning in situations of incarceration, but then also um, for people once they're released, I can easily see them pivoting into uh, these jobs where they would put people on workforce pathways that involve social impact, demonstrations of impact, including things like, you know, trash pickup in business districts and that sort of thing. Again, alluded to by Ted Turner, you know, 10 years ago in that video, oh, poor people should just pick up the trash. And now we can watch them do it and get uh, tokens, uh, impact tokens for investors on that. So again, just a, a few more bits of context is one is like, where does organized crime fit in with the ongoing uh, recycling waste management element once it goes on blockchain? And are they just going to spiff up their image and, and then do it in a socially impact, <laughs> impactful way? Or then also that the, um, the for-profit prison systems are also getting into impact investing in the space. And I can easily foresee uh, some of those returning citizens programs, pay for success programs around recidivism, uh, linking into uh, trash removal. So again, you can you can see I actually I do recycle. I don't need points or badges for that. Um, but that's that's you know who would think that there would be such a big story attached to um, the recycling bin? But in in that respect, I I think there is, and I think we should sort of dig deeper for those stories and and understand their impact on society because it's making somebody money. It's making the people who are creating the internet of bio nano things money. So the problem doesn't go away. You just get a bigger problem that's better managed with more technology that harms the environment and poisons us all in the process. But then we have a social impact market and diabetes or what have you. So, um, in the end, the recycle bank thing went out of business. And you know, what is so <laughs> tragic is at the end is like everybody had these giant stockpiles of points that nobody hardly anybody ever used because we weren't doing it for the points and so then there was this huge push at the time and this is like my education hat on again was like give them to your local school your local school can accept the recycle bank points and then they can get mini grants to do mini things like schoolyard gardens on pavement and like it's such a drop in the bucket because these schools need so much more than just a tiny bit of like recycle bank points. The recycle bank points were never gonna fix the problem with underfunded schools. With schools that were set up to miseducate lots and lots of people because they know that they're not gonna have jobs and they're supposed to sit in a closet in a haptic suit. Ugh. 
So anyway, that is the end of my rant. I think I've covered all of the Oh, one last thing. United by Blue. You should look up United by Blue. This is also greenwashing, and you guys are familiar with the greenwashing, but that's located here. They have, like, a high-end apparel company, and this is this B-Lab. This is the Benefit Corporation, so they offset, like, because they're good corporate stewards, like, their footprint, their ecological footprint with cleaning up waste, which I have to say, yes, it's great. Like, I have seen the benefit of having volunteers come out and clean up waterways of all of this plastic. Definitely, it helps. But I can see this isn't organized by some, like, neighborhood cleanup, right, with, like, somebody picked up you know, a couple boxes of contractor bags and they're, you know, cleaning up short loaded debris. It's not that. This is a corporate enterprise and their packaging, everything is completely set up to feed into the blockchain social impact token market. Um, and again, none of these people could ever imagine they're doing anything wrong, right? Like probably the United by Blue people don't know that the plan is to blockchain that and make people earn programmable script. Um, and harvest their energy and you know so that oh the other piece of this is all of the impact data behind all of the impact data um, at least from IXO Foundation and also IO2 Foundation which is operating in it's out of Hong Kong but they're in China and Brazil the impact data from this stuff and this is something that Joseph is so good at if it, it the blockchain data gets stored away and it gets stored as data that can be used they say to make better decisions, but really it is being going to be used by Singularity Net, which is um, Ben Gertzel's like program to essentially trigger the singularity with these different data data sets, these data sets that are coming off of uh, the, the the different impact sectors. And IO2 Foundation and IXO Foundation were both feeding into something called Ocean Protocol. So if you look up Ocean Protocol, that's the stuff that is collecting and aggregating all of the impact data for AI. So I apologize that the arc is not super clear, but if again, if we just think back to um, media brainwashing, Ted Turner, militarization, blockchain social impact, uh, turning altruistic behavior into digital transactions, tracking it so that global capital can t continue to make bank while harming the environment, while not addressing any of the problem of global supply chains and current consumer culture. And that the people who are gonna be left to clean up the mess are the poor, but increasingly the poor is going to be like everybody. And with smart technologies, we will be put in a panopticon and forced to earn um, script to live and in the process that will be fulfilling the obligations of this giving pledge and the good club where they sort of see you know essentially depopulation while making money as their their key focus and it's not just Gates and it's not just Bloomberg and it's not just Omidyar and Branson and Benioff and Ellison but it's also Ted Turner and Ted Turner I hadn't really thought about him I'm not sure how much longer he's going to be around but um you know there's no sign yet that these philanthropists are slowing down or resting on their laurels. You were a man of great ambition, great I hunger. I still am. Is the hunger still there? Yeah. But, but now I'm hungry for success of the human race and America and all my friends all over the world. How do you want history to see you? I don't know. I, I, I'd like to, ho hopefully you'll see, see me honestly. I, I, I believe in honesty. All I'm doing is good, so, or trying to do good. You know, even the people that don't agree about getting rid of nuclear weapons think it's a good idea to try. He, this, this stuff goes way back. It goes back, I mean, it goes way, way back, but at least this part of it, the media part and the smart technology part goes at least back two decades or so. So anyway, I hope you got something out of this rant and I'm gonna, I'll upload it with some of the images to support uh, what I'm saying so you can follow along. But um, this is important stuff. If you're thinking about crypto, if you're thinking about blockchain, you really need to also be weighing whatever this gold rush is against a future of digital slavery and social prescribing um, that's linked to poverty and wrong kind of green environmentalism. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks, Cedar Tree. <laughs> Strength, healing, and gratitude.